thank you all for coming. Um, in, the, in the theme of uh, Greg's talk, in, 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 to the point of that you're really what you eat, this is really talking about some of these new approaches that we've now developed that uh, influence how, you know, for example, something that people never really thought might be important, which is your diet, turns out it's really important to inform both the uh, response to treatment and also how that might be modulated to try and make uh, new avenues to be treated. So, um, you know, a lot of people in this room <coughs> have actually benefited from this drug, but this drug is actually what has really sparked uh, the uh, re-emergence of cancer immunotherapy as actually being something more than just something that biologists were interested in treating. Because uh, up until the advent of checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy, uh, you know, cancer immunologists or cancer immunologists uh, would all fit into one tiny room, probably smaller than this. Turns out right now cancer immunology is a field that you can't just have in one room, it occupies all of cancer because at every one of these major meetings that we go to, there are 35,000 people, all of whom who claim to be interested in cancer immunology, even though that's not what they were doing six months ago. So the point is that this has really transformed uh, the fate of people. People are getting better. People who once were destined to die within two years are now alive. And that really is what's happening here with these drugs. So people who used to progress, what this demonstrates is that in the first, uh, with this uh, therapy, for the first time ever, there's a tail to the curve that is more than just five or six or seven percent. Thirty-five percent of patients treated with Keytruda or drugs like Keytruda are alive well two years after they've been treated. In th these are patients with advanced cancer who would otherwise have passed away. The problem, however, is that it doesn't necessarily work in everybody. And the question is why, right? So it works because, you know, immune cells are able to recognize tumor. That's that's something that is part of the reason why all of us don't have cancer right now, because cancer is being produced on an ongoing daily basis. The, the cells of the gut lining produce and transform into malignancy, malignant, uh, malignant tumor cells. But the body's immune system is capable of recognizing them and killing them. The problem is, at certain points, the cancer evades the immune system, and it does so by developing a cloaking mechanism that is this PD-1, PD ligand 1 interaction. It turns out what Keytruda does or drugs like Etruda do is that they block that interaction so that now the cancer cell is just much more obvious to the immune system. The immune system does a great job of clearing the cancer. Turns out, however, that it doesn't necessarily work in everybody. One, the immune system doesn't always recognize the cancer. Two, the immune system can recognize the cancer, but it's too weak to actually kill the cancer because of alternative means by which the cancer is able to overcome the immune system. And three, sometimes counter-regulatory mechanisms predominate. You know, immune, the immune system is outweighed by, for example, insufficient T cell fitness because of metabolic things such as what Greg was working on, or because of certain counter-regulatory proteins such as the TIM3 or TIGIT axis that Dr. Zorora has been working on. But one thing that we have really discovered over the last couple of years that is a particularly important is the fact of the host, that is the individual who has cancer that prevents their treatment from actually working as well. And these include many factors, stress, hormonal disturbances, how much money your wife spends on a credit card. But really, one very, very important factor is actually the microbiome. And so that's sort of summarized in this slide. But where the microbiome comes into play is, the microbiome is kind of huge, okay? So the microbiome is basically 10 to the 13 bacteria. For somebody who's trying to comprehend what 10 to the 13 is, it's more money than Donald Trump has. It's basically the amount of money in the national debt, which means if you had 10 to the 13 dollars in dollars, you'd be richer than any man ever alive, and probably all these people, these rich people bunched up. So it's 10 to the 13 bacteria, all inside your gut at any given time. These bugs com comprise, they do a whole host of things. They actually act, help you metabolize the food that you eat. They actually help metabolize the drugs that you consume, they produce vitamins. If, if you don't have certain gut bacteria, you cannot, you cannot have enough vitamin K, for example. It's actually one of the bacteria that's required for the conversion of vitamin K precursors to vitamin K. They're implicated in all sorts of diseases, from obesity to, immune, to immune, certain immune diseases to autism. And uh, what we've been working on is just how this link is in the context of cancer. The link between 
The Western diet and all sorts of immune diseases is really, really well, uh, really well known. There's actually a fantastic paper out of the Stanford group. What they did was they studied this group in uh, sub-Saharan Africa that do not have access to uh, standard diets. They ha hunt foragers for the vast majority of the year. Then for three months out of the year, they uh, have access to a road that you know, allows them to go into the main capital. And for those six months of the year in which they do not have access to the main capital, they're basically eating berries, tubers, roots, and leaves, not McDonald's, right? And during those six months of the year, their blood pressure is lower, they are thinner, and their gut bacteria have a certain profile. For those three months of the year in which they have that access to that road, and they start trucking in and going to the main capital of that sub-Saharan country, their, met their metabolism completely changes. They become a little fatter, their gut bacteria change, and they start having higher blood, high levels of blood pressure and pre-diabetes. So the point is that there's a clear link between the diet, the microbiome, and certain diseases. But as it turns out, what we recently found out is that this, this set of diseases includes not just inflammatory bowel disease and diabetes and stuff that we all care about that's important, but what we most care about is that there's a huge link with cancer. And so what people have been trying to study is in the context of cancer, where does this the sort of these, the, these bloods play a role. I mean, is it imp important just the development of cancer? Is it actually linked to checkpoint inhibitor therapy? So it turns out that there have been five separate studies that have evaluated the role of the microbiome in mediating response to immune therapy. Suffice to say, what we now know is that certain species that are commonly identified, uh, the degree of overlap between all these studies is variable, and there are lots of differences between the definition of a responder and non-responder between all these studies, as well as the sequencing and the bioinformatic pipeline and so on. But the point is, certain species are common to responders, and certain species are uh, common to non-responders. Now, the direct proof of concept between the immunological side effects of these bugs and the presence of these bugs is indirect. It's not direct, but that's what we're working on. And so what we now know is that, you know, there are certain things that are good, for example, the presence of certain bacteria here, and there are certain bugs that are not so good, and that's the bugs on the right. And what we've now, uh, what we're now working on is whether or not these bugs actually make a difference. So what we did over here is that some of you have really been very helpful here. So this is sort of the theme that we're trying to echo here is that the, this research is very A, patient-centric, and two, honestly, very patient-dependent. So when we ask you for those stool samples, Trust me, we are actually doing a lot of things with it. We're not just collecting it and the shit doesn't just end up on a shelf somewhere. <laughs> this is actually being analyzed. And the proof of that is here. So we actually took these samples, and it turns out this is very, very valuable poop, because these samples came from two cohorts of patients. One, some of you who've had uh, outstanding responses to checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and some of you who've been on a clinical trial that uh, uh, we led out of here. Uh, that uh, Dr. Zoro got a big round for. And we actually took these samples from you guys. You guys gave us the samples. Some of you were more recalcitrant, some of you were less recalcitrant. Uh, we had to call you guys quite frequently, but suffice to say we got samples from both people, people who did well and people who did not do quite so well. And what we found is very, very interesting. The first thing we found was that there was a significantly increased in the responders, in, in people who did well in this treatment, a significantly increased number of certain bugs. And what's very interesting about these bugs is that these are not the same bugs that were found in, in the studies done by these other groups, which sort of uh, makes one wonder. Because we took studies, we took these uh, uh, stool specimens from people who've done really, really well and really, really well at two years. That's sort of the time point at which people have stopped being treated. And these people who've done really well have now actually stopped treatment or about to stop treatment. And what we're able to show, therefore, is that these bugs may actually be the ones that are mediating the difference in why people are responding, suggesting that not only are these other cohorts less accurate, we don't know that for a fact, but that the Pittsburgh cohort uh, definitely appears to show different bugs that may be more tightly linked with having a good outcome than the, other, than the bugs identified by the other cohort, which suggests that maybe modulating the microbiome may be something that can actually reverse the fact that people, some people do not respond to this drug. So the question is, if, it, if, you know, if, if that's a theoretical exercise, just how can you do it? Well, as it turns out, this has actually been done already. Modulating the microbiome is not exactly a new exercise, at least in the context of certain infections, especially a really, really bad hospital-acquired infection known as C. diff. Uh, you, you actually do this some, through something known as FMT, a fecal microbiome transplant. 
For those who want to know what an FMT looks like, it's actually you know fairly. Uh, it's 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 really not very very um, surprising. It basically is a stool sample. You get a stool sample from a close relative who's healthy. You know, uh, usually that person is somebody's uh, spouse or somebody's living in the same household, and you bring it in. You give it to the gastroenterologist. This is literally a stool sample in a styrofoam box or a Pyrex container that hopefully one doesn't use again. And then the gastroenterologist takes that sample, puts it into a blender, mixes the blender, and takes out the aliquot, puts that into the, uh, through a colonoscopy, and ministers it to the patient, and that has a 93% success rate in eradicating C. diff. A company decided that they were gonna try and monetize this, and that's the name of the company here, it's called Open Biome, and they basically have healthy donors that have chosen to donate, you know, obviously for a fee, and these are very lean, healthy donors. And uh, they sell the shipment now, and patients obtain this, and uh, it's very effective at eradicating C. diff. The efficacy rate in the eradication of C. diff is about 97%. So what we did was we wanted to know whether or not we can actually use this to try and treat patients. So we've obtained stool samples from PD-1-treated patients. So these are patients who've had outstanding responses to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So definition of cure as is currently conceived, so more than two years from initial treatment, no evidence of disease. They've agreed to donate samples and very kindly agreed to be stuck uh, to give us some blood to make sure we don't have any infectious uh, agents present in the blood. The samples are screened, they're tested. Uh, if anybody's interested, we can show you what the lab looks like. I promise it doesn't smell. And uh, we're using that to treat patients who are unfortunately not quite uh, responsive to the agent as one would hope. And that's essentially the basis of this study. It's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fairly large study, but it's not as large as we would like, but it's uh, fairly large. We're really looking for people who have not had a good response to checkpoint inhibitor therapy up front, and that are amenable to getting this as an investigative product. Uh, they are, we're looking for two cohorts of patients, one with, one without liver uh, lesions, and these patients get a uh, Keytruda that is given as a standard drug, but they're also getting uh, this investigational product that we are making that is FDA, uh, that is uh, being made under an IND, that is an investigational new drug product from the FDA, uh, being made in a lab run by Dr. Zoro and I up on the first floor. And uh, they get one administration of this, and we check their stool to make sure that this product that we're administering both transforms the stool, and also that this transformation is maintained while they're on this study. And um, what we are looking to see is whether this actually does transform the stool the way a microbiome uh, is transformed in the context of, uh, in the context of uh, fecal microbiome transplants. So really this is now you know, completely all the rage. Melanoma, immune uh, therapy, and the microbiome is really something that is uh, completely transforming the field. Uh, that's our study on clinicaltrials.gov in case anybody thinks we are smoking, we're blowing smoke. And uh, this is, it's actually currently been featured in a bunch of different uh, publications as well. So we're very excited about this study. It's a subject of, you know, some major grant funding that Dr. Zoror has gotten, uh, you know, sort of these million dollar grants. But the point is, it's not quite enough because we actually need to show proof. And so the question is, what can you guys do to help us? The first thing is, we need more donors. We would not be this far if we didn't have these 25 patients who've given us stool samples. But 25 is not enough. We would like 50, 60, 70, 80 donors because the key thing, the key proof of concept lies in the stool from patients who've done really well. Currently, across the entire country, there are about between 15,000 patients who've been adequately treated with PD-1 monotherapy and have obtained an outstanding response. So if you know of anybody who's done really well in this treatment or if you're one of these patients and you're uh, able to help us, just contact us. There's actually somebody who's in charge of the study, that's me, that's my cell phone number, you can call me at any time if you'd like to donate, we'll, uh, I was gonna say that we'll come and pick it up, but <laughs> I don't quite know about that. I will arrange for it to be picked up. Uh, Sydney, who's our, our uh, uh, the clinical trial person in charge of the study, uh, coordinates this, you can email her at any time. She also is very, very keen to respond. And really, honestly, this is one of the easier samples that you can donate, it, it doesn't hurt, right? I mean, everybody knows that it doesn't hurt. Two, you produce it almost every day, and if you aren't, well, you need to take some Senna, Cole, some Merlax. And three, uh, you know, it's free, right? <laughs> you have to go. And, and the other thing is, you know, we, 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 if you're very interested, if this is something that's sort of up your alley, you know, please feel, uh, feel free to call us, talk, uh, or at any time, you know, Dr. Zoro and I are available. 
uh, at any point in time, and you know, just let other people know about it. You know, if you think that this is something that's sort of up your alley, uh, get in touch with us, and we're happy to have you talk about it or answer any questions you might have about the study. So, with that, uh, we're very, very grateful to many members of the melanoma team, Dr. Kirkwood, Dr. Najar, Dr. Zoror, uh, but also the FMT lab, which is up and running now on the sec on the first floor and the lab members from Dr. Zoro's lab were actually helping us to do this. And you know, this is not possible without everybody in the clinic from Melissa, Ashley, Catherine, all these people that you guys are actually contacting. They actually, the, the frontline people actually help us with the study. So thank everybody. And we'd also like to thank the patients who've really made a difference. We're actually treating our first patient in two weeks. And uh, he's coming here all the way from Ohio to be treated. So uh, if anybody has any questions, please get in touch. Right.